get involved in politics on male terms too. I think they should do it on their own terms. In the studio, Carol Taylor, newly elected alderman for Vancouver. Kim Campbell, recently elected MLA for Vancouver Point Grey. And Johanna Den Hertog, co-chairperson of the Policy Review Committee and former candidate for the federal NDP. Sitting in for Jack Webster, Iona Campanolo. enough women in politics? No. <laughs> women in politics. Where will the next generation come from? What will their objectives be? Are the people who make up over 52% of our population fairly represented now? Do you think there are enough women in politics? No, not enough. Not nearly. No. Would you like to see more then? Absolutely. 50-50? Uh, yes, or more even. Do you think there are enough women in politics? I think there is, yeah. yeah. How about you? Do you think there's enough sure. women in politics? Actually, I don't. I think there should be more. Probably too many. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the women have, have as much right as men. There should, maybe should be more. I don't know. Man's made a hell of a mess of things. <laughs> oh, there'll never be enough women in politics. Oh, how about you? <laughs> I, I agree. No, there aren't. No? Would you like to see a lot more? Sure, a lot more. Uh, too many, I figure. <laughs> I might as well be honest. Isn't that true? Yeah. Uh, there are very, seem to be very few uh, uh, women polit politicians on the... Uh, on the uh, provincial scene, but federally, uh, yes, there should be more, but I think uh, women are fairly well represented. There like should be more, yes. More? Lots more. 50, 50? It should be equal. 50, yeah. There should be equality in everything. It should be whether or not the person can do the job, and right now, I really don't have any faith in the politicians we have whatsoever. Male or female? Male or female. I think women should have an equal right to join in politics like every other male. Besides, I appreciate the woman's point of view. It's different for a change. I think maybe um, they're more aggressive than men in many ways. So, um, so I think there's a place for women in politics, just as there is for men. Yeah. I think that they get involved in politics on male terms, too. I think they should do it on their own terms. In the studio, Carol Taylor, newly elected alderman for Vancouver. Kim Campbell, recently elected MLA for Vancouver Point Grey. And Johanna Den Hertog co-chairperson of the Policy Review Committee and former candidate for the federal NDP. Sitting in for Jack Webster, Iona Campanolo. Hello, and for Webster tonight, we're going to take a look at the new generation of women in pol politics in this province, but I thought I'd start with a review of the dates when th the first women came into these spheres. 1936, Helena Gutteridge became the first woman elected to the Vancouver City Council. Carol Taylor sits there today. 1918, Mary Ellen Smith first elected to the legislature in Victoria. And of course, we have Kim Campbell there today. 1921, Agnes McPhail blazed a trail all the way to the House of Commons, and Joanna Den Hartog ran for election in the 1984 campaign for the federal house. You know, everyone's fond of saying you've come a long way, baby. Well, a lot of us think we haven't come nearly far enough, so that's what we're going to be talking about tonight because we're going to explore the new generation, the new women, and talk about how much has politics changed, what has changed, if anything, is it for the better, is it for the worse, where are we going? So first off, I guess my first question is going to be, why did you enter politics? I'll start with you, Carol. <laughs> That's the hardest one to answer, of course. But I think being a political journalist for all those years, my interest was always there. But in deciding to run for politics, I had to be willing to give up my journalism career because you can never go back home, as they say. And I found that I, after so many years of looking at stories or problems or social crises and speaking to the experts and speaking to the people and trying to figure out a solution, all I could do was broadcast it. And I could make a suggestion as to what I thought should happen, but I had no real power. 
and I felt at 40 a certain frustration at not being able to carry through and actually do some changing and felt that rather than being an old lady sitting in a rocking chair at 90 saying, someday I'll run, I thought, well, this is it. I better start now. That's the biggest decision you take. Well, why did you seek power, Kim? Well, I've always been interested in politics, and I was a political scientist before I became a lawyer. I got involved in politics running for school board in Vancouver, uh, and that was a very specific concern because I had some concerns that my, the students I was teaching at the university had such a broad range of preparation that it seemed that there was a great deal of luck of the draw, uh, where they went to high school, how well they would perform. But more than that, when I was a political scientist, I was a Soviet specialist. And I think when you're very familiar with a society in which there is no politics, you come to see how important politics is. And democracy is very fragile. It's a very imperfect system. But it's one that requires a great deal of the people who are involved. In it. It's not a society that can thrive if people sit on the fence and say, well, somebody else will do it. And I like people. I find the issues fascinating. Politics is the one career that lets you do everything. It's intellectually stimulating, it's personally rewarding, you get a wonderful chance to meet people, and uh, it just, it's never boring, it's never dull. It's the one career for which you cannot really be trained. And Johanna, what motivates you? Well, I think that one of the reasons was a real great interest in different social questions of the day. Um, about over 10 years ago, I guess, I became involved in various issues in the community. I think many people start in politics in that sense, and I did too. Uh, at that time, primarily around uh, status of women issues, actually. I was active in the status of women. I was also uh, involved in the founding of Rape Relief here in Vancouver, and subsequent to that became involved in other questions, not just around the status of women. And you quickly find out that all things are, are political and then also questions on the status of women, questions on how our society works both economically and on social questions are political. And it's a very exciting world and I suppose that both because those kind of questions were important to me and because it's an exciting thing to do and an important thing to do, I was finally convinced, uh, honestly speaking, to actually seek office myself. Well, one of the changes that I've noticed that is encouraging to me is that the women of your generation seem to be able to combine family and politics, which really wasn't allowed to us in our generation to any great degree. You're a new mother, Johanna. How is it, how is it fitting in with your political life? Well, so far, fine. I have a 13-month-old son and uh, a very uh, um, supportive husband who very much believes also in the equality of both men and women. Um, and so far it works out fine, however it is very busy and I think that uh, one, of the, one of the new areas of, of change that we need to see in our society is for also our political structures and our work structures to be able to make it more real and more able for women to actually enter politics. There's no question that, that it still takes a superhuman effort to do both, to, to participate in the political arena and to have children. This, the, the structures aren't there, syndrome, aren't there know, yet all had to, to be support Mrs. it. Chatelaine or Mrs. Superstar. It seems to me also that, uh, well, right now, Sheila Copps is blazing a bit of a path because she's the first woman to have mm -hmm. a baby going through the House of Commons, and I can see her getting up and yelling at the opposition every day. Sooner or later, someone's going to remind her about her condition and watch out. <laughs> <laughs> How does family work for you, Carol? Well, it's very difficult. I think anyone who pretends that it's all glorious and easy is not telling the truth. It's difficult to keep all of your priorities and make sure that you are giving fair and equal time to family and career and a little bit of time for yourself. Um, but it's interesting when you mention pregnancy in the House of Commons because when you see when I started in journalism I was one of the few women there so I feel like I'm doing this for the second time this bit for women <laughs> because when I started in journalism there were no other women around except as secretaries and so all of my working partners were male and all of the the, um, the times that they wanted to give me a story it was usually women's issues and I had to fight and say that I have a right to cover the war in Israel as you do or the revolution in Chile and when I got pregnant I insisted on staying on camera big and pregnant and uh, that was the first at that time they really felt very awkward about it and felt a little uneasy but we worked through that and now of course you see all sorts of news reporters uh, I think Sandy Ronaldo's had two on camera yes and so yes. we get through these barriers one by one and I think politics is just a little bit slower than some of the other professions in coming to that recognition and I'm mm. not sure why it's slower why do, why does politics follow rather than lead I don't know either Kim do you find already that you're a role model and that you have to live up to uh, what other women expect you to do? Yes, I know. It's interesting. I have noticed an enormous transformation 
in women's attitudes towards women politicians in the last 10 years. I find now that women that I meet, and women my own, own age, and women older than me, very, very supportive, very, very willing to work hard for women candidates, no longer seeing, you know, maybe just the odd woman as somebody that they would target to support, but, but, but generally feeling that it's very important to have a woman's outlook. In other words, I don't feel that I'm being hived off, being expected to be different. I think anyone in public life is a role model in certain ways. I mean, you give up a certain amount of your right to be free. One of the things that interested me, in addition to, to what Sheila Cox is doing, is that when the uh, Parti Québécois had their leadership, one of their candidates was a woman who had just given birth to her fourth child. And I think what's, what's happening in our society, I thought that was perhaps even more remarkable than, than what's happening with Sheila Cox, because here was an, a very large family responsibility. But I think, once again, that, that we're getting a shift in attitude. My grandmother had to give up her teaching job when she got married. I mean, oh we're, yes, as we're soon now, as they married, they no longer were allowed to be employed. That's right. And I think that now we are seeing women saying, look, there are many things that women do. Politics is one career among many. I have uh, friends in the legal profession who have families and continue to practice law. And they certainly do have to make special arrangements. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that there's no question about it that it's difficult. But I think what women are saying is that our experience whether it's as mothers or whatever, is part of the mainstream. We're not in the minority. Our skills and ability are needed in society, and therefore society has to take some account of that. But what society is missing, in my view, is that men and women together form both halves of the human consciousness. And if we are going to only have one half of that human consciousness being used, then we're wasting a great deal of effort. Look at the television every night. Who's at all the peace conferences? Who's at all the UN conferences? Miles of males, and they're probably 100% male at the conferences, and 90% male reporters. Why are we so slow in bringing about these changes? Well, I think that part of it is attitudinal but we have gone very far in that question. What we haven't yet recognized, I think, adequately through, through work, through the political parliament structure, and even through our own party, some parties I think are better than others, but <laughs> is that it will take quite a few structural changes for it to really be possible for not just a minority of women to participate, but the vast majority of women to participate. Because if the, the if we want that kind of participation, we need both in nomination campaigns and election campaigns, childcare to be a realistic thing that is provided for women. Now the New Democrats have begun to do that a lot in the last five years or so. Um, we need to see that conventions have a different kind of structure so that people who have family responsibilities can still participate. Right. We need parliaments where people who need to go home and cook for children or be with children for a while, men or women, are able to participate well, in that Well, if they can do it at Mitsubishi, sense. they can at least do it in the House of That's Commons. Right. We'll be back with Johanna Den Hartog, with Kim Campbell, and with Carol Taylor after the break. Do you think there are enough women in politics? No, of course not. <laughs> yes, and I think there should be a better balance between male and female in politics. surprise. Sure. I once had a great liberal tell me that every single Back again with our panel on women in politics with the emphasis on young women. And we were saying just a moment ago that there is more support from women for women than there used to be. And that's one of the big changes and changes for the better. I was thinking about Agnes MacPhail came 65 years ago to the House of Commons and it was thought then that there would be many, many women follow. Do you know that in the period of time since she came, there was only 9.6% of the House of Commons have been women? And I once had a great liberal tell me every single woman who had ever been elected was a political error. <laughs> so, you know, we go back to the person's case when women were declared people. And uh, some people wonder about uh, why we're so excited about that. And I think that when we look at you, we feel some of the answer. I'm going to go to the phones, and I'm going to ask some of our callers to put their views on the record. You're on the air. Hello, Mrs. Campanola? Yes. Yes, I'd like to ask uh, a question, somewhat hypothetical, if I may. Um, if there is a job opening, and, and there's a man qualified and a woman qualified, but the man has a wife and a family to support, do you think the man should be given preference to the job? Well, I'm going to ask Kim Campbell to have a go at that, and then I'll give you something that I call the Priscilla Principle. Okay. 
Well, no, I don't think that should be a consideration in hiring at all, because you haven't told me what the woman's financial responsibility is. Well, just uh, in the, in I mean, the I don't think it should be a consideration. No, I has to support a wife and family, and the woman is single and just to support herself. I think that personally, that the man should be given the job, and a lot of people might be screaming foul. Uh, well, if I thought that single mothers got the same kind of preference, I might take a different view. But I think once you get into making those kinds of distinctions, it's very invidious, and I don't like it at all. I think that, that jobs should be given by qualification. But what I think is, is very important to think about is, is that we have a philosophy of wages for certain jobs where we expect them to be able to support a family. In other areas of the workforce, what we call the female job ghettos, those wages are not sufficient to support a family. And that's where we really get into the difficulties just in our so wage long, philosophy. Just so long, caller, as you don't mind, when a single man comes up for a job and a woman who has children to support comes up for the job and that she gets the nod too, if you're going to use that. I think 100 percent. If the woman is, is equally qualified and she has a child and it's a single man, she should be given the job whole, wholeheartedly, for sure. Well, if all things are equal, in my estimation, every time I've ever seen it happen, if a man and woman are equal and they're both going toward the job, the woman will drop out at the last moment in favor of the man. That's what I call the Priscilla Principle. Thanks for calling. Moving on to another call. You're on the air. Yes, Miss Campanula. I am the daughter of one of the first suffragettes in Scotland, and I've always been so interested in women and getting along. But I have come to the conclusion after many years that the reason that we haven't got women in the majority is because women are not loyal to each other. We've been just saying that women are more supportive of each other now than they used to be. I don't find it amongst the people I talk to. Perhaps it's because it's the older generation. But they're still against women doctors and women lawyers. We're all no good because we're women. It has to be a man. Tell us about your mother. <laughs> Oh, she was one of the suffragettes in Scotland way back when I was a girl. <laughs> and she kept you as a feminist? Oh, very much so. <laughs> very much so. <laughs> Thank you very much. I've never been a popular person because of that. <laughs> oh, well, you'll be popular with the women who come after, the grandchildren and the great-granddaughters that come after you. Thank you for your call. We're going to go to Nelson now. Uh, Nelson, you're on the air. Uh, yes, I own a... I just uh, want to let it be known that I support the women's equal rights and everything, but the one question I have is my wife is a professional, and when our, uh, we decided to have a family and uh, they needed looking after and she wanted to work, I had to pay every cent of their care out of my hip pocket. I didn't have a government come running in and say, oh, well, that's all right, uh, you don't need to uh, pay, we'll pay that. and. Uh, the equal rights is a wonderful thing, but when is it going to get equal? I don't see any men getting 19 weeks paid vacation to go out and have uh, a baby or anything like that, and uh, this is what irks me. If women want to uh, be equal, let them be equal, but let them pay their own way too. I'll hang up and listen to your response. Thank you. Johanna, would you like to talk to him? I, I totally agree with the caller's point that uh, if we really want equality, we must ensure that both men and women are able to participate equally in terms of raising children. Um, I don't think the answer is not paying anybody. I think, I think the only way that the average person can really both work or participate in the public process and have children is for us to have decent maternity, paternity, parental leave provisions and also benefits during that period. And really Canada, Canada compared to most other countries in the world is very far behind and only in the last couple of years now with the uh, changes recently to the federal, federal law, uh, yes. labor code where we now have both men and women eligible for 24 weeks childcare leave. Um, we're beginning to inch along in that process and uh, I think it's I think it'll have very good effects on our society. Kim you had a comment. Well I wanted to make the point that we sometimes th think of children totally in terms of their own families but surely we as a society have a collective interest in having healthy, well-brought-up children. I may not have children of my own, but Joanna's child and Carol's children are going to pay my pension when I retire. I have a very strong vested interest in the continuation of my society, whether I have children myself or not. And that's something that's, that's a value that sometimes gets lost in the shuffle. It's why everybody pays school taxes, not just people who have children in school. We all have a vested interest in healthy young people growing up. We have a vested interest in their all being able to develop themselves to the best of their ability. I want to know 
that as I get older, there are going to be doctors and lawyers and accountants there ready to look after me. I want there to be creative people, filmmakers, writers, all of the people who are going to enrich my society. And therefore, I have to give something to make sure that that happens. And that gets that point of view gets lost often. I think Can it I does. Go ahead, Carol. Add one other thing. I think this man's point is is a huge one, actually. And, yes, and it's it goes, brought up a great deal. And it goes far beyond children because what he's basically saying is if we're sitting here demanding rights, we also should look after our responsibilities. And I think that in the early stages of any big movement or revolution, there is a tendency to be so focused on righting some of the past wrongs that we're not keeping up with some of the responsibilities that also go with it. And I, I think that he's right. We all, have to, uh, we all have to look to that. And uh, the problem is that women have been just so out of balance with the scheme of things that it's doing, it does take some catching up, but also you have to ask questions. Is it fair that a man is required to support a woman for the rest of her life uh, just because a marriage doesn't work? Well, I think that's a, that's a question, isn't but it? But there are a lot of responsibilities that we're also forbidden to be part of. For instance, if we want to be equal in society, we should also be willing to go to war. We should also be willing to participate in combat on behalf of our country. We should also be with full rights in the church. We should have full rights in many areas that we don't have. We want all those responsibilities <laughs> and we can't get them. That's <laughs> right. It's not a lack of desire to have the responsibilities. There's one reason, though, I think why traditionally women have not been in combat roles in war, with very few exceptions, although now everybody's in combat because there's no such thing as a battlefield anymore. But if you have in a community the survival of 10 women and one man, your, your community could survive. If you have the survival of 10 men and one woman, your community died. And I think that's traditionally why women yes. were kept out of that. And it, that's, it's a very s deep atavistic uh, view of, of the relative roles. But if you ask deeply into the reason mm -hmm. why Canadian women are not allowed in combat roles, you will be told that it is not the opinion of the person who is responding to you, of course, but that <laughs> it, is, it is the fact that the wives of the presently enlisted men would not want women in their combat units. Mm -hmm. And it's always blamed on the other women. Whether or not they feel that way, we never know because we never hear it from them. Well, I think I've got time for just one more call before we go to another break. You're on the air. Hello there. Go ahead. Um, I'd like to use the opening of the program as an example of what I'd like to speak about. The question that was asked to the people on the street was whether or not there should be more women in politics. Now, I'd like to have a comment on this seeming obsession with ratios of men to women in politics. Should not the women be qualified? Should, Should not, not the men? Qualified? I mean, after all, we have men going into politics who are certainly no more qualified than a lot of the women who run against them who are not elected. So you want to talk qualification? I'll start with you, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that Yes, in the best of all worlds, you wouldn't talk about ratios. You would just talk about the best people. But clearly, there are all sorts of very talented, good women out there who haven't had a, a shot at being elected. And that goes back to the nomination process to a great extent. There is a tendency that for women to be nominated in ridings where that particular party doesn't have a good chance of winning. We all know that. Whether we say it or not is another thing, but we know that. The ridings that are soft seats traditionally have gone to men. And that is slowly changing as women become, I mean, women we were talking about before are so much of the power behind the scenes in these political campaigns. And they're beginning to see that, you know, in supporting other women through the entire process, nomination on through and good seats, that some changes will be made. Well, it may come as a great shock to uh, viewers, but uh, I have served in the House of Commons, and I can tell you there are a lot of people there who may or may not be the best and the brightest. They are commons, after all, just ordinary people doing, ask, being asked to do extraordinary things. And we're going to be talking about this a little bit more right after the break. Do you think there are enough women in politics? Too many, probably. I think 50-50, yeah, why not, you know? Okay. Oh, yeah, definitely. Welcome back. There's an old saying in politics about women. That is that all the rules are a mystery, and the team doesn't want girls on it anyway. Well, we're going to find out what this phone caller says. Go ahead, you're on the air. Well, I'm, I'm certainly happy to see some girls on the team. <laughs> Good. Uh, congratulations to all of you for being on this program. Um, I'm glad to see that there's more and more women coming into politics because I think it's necessary. 
if we're to exist in this world, at the world level, there aren't enough women. At the federal level, there aren't enough women. At NBC, it's looking a little better, but we still have a long way to go. Um, equality is what it's going to take to save this world in the condition that it's in. I don't believe that we'll have as much war if we have more women uh, in politics. And that's the area that most of our young people are worrying about. But for Kathy Taylor, I'd like to ask her what she's going to do for the single woman in Vancouver who has children and can't get a, a home on the west side where they want to live and feel safe. And they're forced into the ghetto areas because they're on welfare. The, I think it's a catch-22 situation. And for um, Iona, I'd like to ask her, uh, how do you... Uh, why didn't you run for uh, prime minister last time when you had an opportunity to? And if you don't want to this time, then it should be Adrian Clarkson or somebody like that. Adrian's a Tory. She couldn't run for leader of our party. <laughs> anyway, first question to Carol. Uh, clearly, I think the most disadvantaged segment of our society are mothers with kids. It's just so incredibly difficult for them. And we've set up a task force uh, just with the recent inaugural that will specifically be looking at children and single mothers in, in the city with the view to seeing what we can do. I've spent a lot of time with the, um, or some time with the food bank that deals specifically for single mothers. And it's such a good idea because what they've done is food banks are really depersonalizing, difficult, degrading situation that people have to go through to get enough food. They have taken the mothers and the children out of those lineups. They put them in a different location. The mothers can go there in their little rooms there where the kids can go off and play a little bit. The mothers can get a few minutes peace to themselves. They can also put together bags of groceries that they choose because we all know our children do not eat what someone else decides is a good nutritional thing that they will eat. So that, you know, that sort of program has to be expanded so that we make sure that mothers and children, first of all, we're, we're meeting their nutritional needs. Then we have to look at housing because those mothers have the, the least amount left over from their welfare checks to pay for housing. What they do is they try and get into the best neighborhoods so they can get good schools for their kids. Then they have so little money left over for food that they are in dire straits. So we've got to do something, whether it's a, a subsidy, a rental subsidy that's very specific, whatever it is, we've got to pull together people from all political parties. I just don't think that this is a I political issue. I think some issue. things are nonpartisan. We and that's have one to of start them. talking about it and saying this is too important to play games with. Mm -hmm. What but are we going to yeah. do? But we do need political decisions to make some of those things happen. Well, that's right. We, but we, you when and women I can are sit down. Poor, but and, we can all sit down together and talk about this. I and bet say, you could you do it at this table right well, here. Well, we might be able to, but we do have to recognize that it's not an answer to have food banks. That we do need massive changes in things like the minimum wage and in things like child care that so far our provincial government hasn't uh, dealt C with. Can I, can I just make a the comment? The caller, caller's got one more question. Let's let her have it. Go ahead. Go ahead with your question. Go ahead with your question. Well, how about her. why you're not oh, running she's for gone. prime minister? <laughs> oh, why I didn't run. Uh, because I gave my word I wouldn't and because I want to make sure that everyone knows that when women say they're going to do something, they do it and they do it right to the end and they finish and they do wh exactly what they said they would do. Can I address a point? The caller made talked about that she felt there wouldn't be as many wars if there were women. I think there is a kind of a, a, a mythology that some people have about women in politics and women can change the world. The most important thing for people to recognize is that women are people. We sit here with different political views on many issues. We are as individualistic as any man. and We have our own particular perspectives. When I was a lawyer, I wasn't a lady lawyer. I was a lawyer. Woman when I lawyer. taught, when I taught, uh, yeah, but you know, this is my lady <laughs> lawyer, my lady doctor. I wasn't a lady professor. And anymore, if, if I were a mechanic, I wouldn't be a lady mechanic. And so you're not a lady politician, thank I'm, God. I am a politician. And I, but what's so important about having women in politics is that there are some areas of life that women experience differently, not just in terms of areas where they may find discrimination now, but in terms of their life experience. And that is a perspective that has to be represented. In our caucus, for example, Carol Grant, who is a member from Langley, speaks up very strongly for daycare because she has been a single parent raising two little kids. And the daycare subsidy is what kept her from poverty, enabled her to continue in a career which has made her self-sufficient, and now she can make a contribution. And it's that outlook that has got to be part of the political process. And, and when women and are if not she in wasn't politics, there, no one would be making that point, and that's why the microcosm of society has to be represented inside all the parties and inside Precisely. all the governments. And Otherwise, we, we don't have those voices. And one woman can't do it. 
because there is a variety of life experiences that women have, and that's why the numbers make sure that you have a broad representation of women's experiences. Well, we're going to go to another call. You're on the air. Good evening, Iona. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, thank you, and, and thanks for this great show. Oh, my, I'm glad you're enjoying it. My question really is to Kathy Taylor. Do you consider yourself... Carol. Carol. Or Carol, I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. Do you consider yourself an older woman or an older man? Well, I'm an alderman because that's the legal term. Uh, Vancouver City Council did request that the provincial government change it to councillor, as many other cities have, because that has no connotations of male or female, and uh, I would support that too. We never care what they call us as long as we get the power. Uh, you know, I really, I think this is an important point. I think that we waste a lot of time and energy on that sort of thing, which is not important. What is important is making sure that some things are changed. I remember my first, uh, my, the first time I ever filled out a form for election was for an alderman. And uh, so I crossed it out and wrote older woman, and I had to go back just before the deadline and redo it because it's not a legal term. I don't care what they call us as long as we get the job done. Well, I differ That's with right. that. I you guess. differ. I, Johanna I think has that, a different I opinion. I think that there is a reason that language uh, in terms of describing humanity in male terms is, is a serious question. I think that as long as we continue to accept that, and I don't think we are accepting it any longer, I think the society is changing. I think though that as long as we would accept it, we sort of pretend that women don't exist and that it is important for those changes to be made in language for chairperson or city councillor because it, it's a small measure, it's only a very, very small measure, but it shows that we're beginning to say that women have a fully equal oh, role I, I in society. I agree with that too, except it leads to some pretty peculiar language when you're saying Madam Chair or Mr. Chair and all What's those kinds of things. What's ironic is that I think, I don't know the old origin of the term alderman, but the, the, the man in chairman doesn't mean man, it means comes from manas meaning to direct. So I, I, uh, I think we get into some semantic problems. But I'm, I'm not totally lacking in what you might call semantic determinism, mm. <laughs> linguistic determinism. I think that where we can neutralize the language as much as possible, it's, it's, it's positive. More calls for this feisty panel after the break. So what about the insults? Are women tough enough to take the political insults? There are a lot of them. We're all told we have to have a very thick skin. Do you think that's necessary? Well, you see, I think that's interesting. I don't want people making political decisions for me and my life and my family that have thick skins. That's just the very opposite of the person I want making decisions. I want someone who has sensitivity, who cares, who's intelligent, knowledgeable, and all of those things, but not someone who's just thick skin. So does so Carol Taylor get hurt when she sees herself called a Barbie doll in the newspaper? Well that one was sort of silly enough not to be hurt, but of course you get hurt. <laughs> of course you do. But I think that that shouldn't be the reason for not playing the game. You have to hang in and say, all right. And you know, remain sensitive. You know, you go ahead, you play your game the way you want to play it, but I will continue to participate and I won't let you drive me out by somebody doing personal name calling. Kim? Well, I don't think I've ever had a lot of problem with insults specifically directed to me as a woman but anybody who sticks their head out of the trenches in public life is going to get shot at and sometimes things are very cruel and they really hurt you and you well, want you, you you to put a, you want to put a paper bag over your head and never appear in public again and that's why it's very important for anyone in public life to have support systems around you family friends that help you to keep your sense of perspective the irony is that certainly for any woman running for the federal parliament from this province it's very difficult to do that. The logistics, of, as you well know, of serving this province from Ottawa are almost impossible. And it's interesting that of the women who are serving us now, I think most of them are, are, are divorced or the children are grown. And that's a great pity because uh, it makes it even harder for them, if you're, you're on the move, to rebuild those kinds of personal structures that everyone needs in public life. You know, when men get up and talk about their dear wife, Tilly, boy, when you're in public life, you, I mean, my, my husband, is my greatest asset because he helps me to keep my sense of perspective. And I think that's an area well, where women... It certainly does make it easier. It really yes. does. Johanna? Well, I, I think, first of all, that women participating in politics is already changing the image of who is a politician. Yes. And that is helpful. I know that when I ran, and as anyone who runs, you, sure, you get barbs thrown at you. But in a way, people treat the political process slightly differently if you're a woman, too. And um, first of all, I think that there's more recognition nowadays than there perhaps was 20 years ago that support is a good thing. 
support for a candidate within a party is a good and a necessary thing. I think the old image of the politician, the male politician, with just the family as support, rather than the party supporting, or structures like childcare supporting, is beginning to be passé. And uh, I know in our party, at least, that there are new ways of being able to support candidates and MPs that are beginning, beginning to be, I don't want to paint it as a bed of roses, but are beginning to be positive. And I think for women who are experiencing candidacy for the first time, at least I did, it's far more positive than I ever imagined it to be. Well, I'm sure I, you I get barbs, but it is yes. a very positive experience. It's just part of the whole thing. And at least you know when you're getting barbs that men get barbs too. And yes, so that, sure. in that, at least, it's equal. We'll go to I, the phones. I, I find it ironic, though, that, I mean, nobody's ever called me a Barbie doll uh, because I don't know. No, they've called okay, you well, an elitist yuppie. That's right. Oh, elitist yuppie. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, but, you know, Carol is an, a very attractive woman in public life, and I find it ironic that she was called a Barbie doll by somebody very far on the far left who ought to know better. That's the other dimension that goes in there and I know I, you know, you're a very attractive woman and that's something that I think you probably had to contend oh, I, with. Uh, that's it's why I was delighted to see a new Barbie doll on the scene. It means that I can now retire to grandmother <laughs> and that's a, that's a good thing. A probably. terrible stereotyping. I got, I got a lot more respect once my hair turned gray. Here we go to another call. You're on the air. Well, first of all, I would like to wish you all a Merry Christmas. And the same Thank to you. you. Thank you too. Madam Cavanola. Yes. And. Um, Ms. Uh, Campbell, I'm not so sure who you married, but that's beside the point. Congratulations on your He kept uh, his maiden name. Uh, <laughs> marriage. But anyway, I'm very, very um, interested in calling you this evening and telling you that I came home at 4.30 this afternoon to cook dinner for my wife. <laughs> Bravo. Who's coming in from North Vancouver, and I happen to live in Kitsilano. And I happen to hear a lot of the, uh, uh, well, a lot of different subjects. and. Uh, I'm not going to care to uh, this evening uh, debate them all, but nonetheless, I just want to say that Webster must be sitting back in spring. Uh, uh, what's the name of that island? Whatever it is. Maui. Boat. He's on Maui and he's golfing. <laughs> yeah, problem. Oh, is he? Yeah. Well, I'm sure he's not being uh, forest fed to watch this, but nonetheless, I just happen to say that in 1896, my three great grandparents landed in Canada, and they happen to be from Ukraine, which. Besides the point, nonetheless, my grandmother had 11 children, and my mother, who happened to be in business, and she ran a rest home, and she was a non-professional, uh, non uh, you know, nurse, but nonetheless, she ran a rest home, a halfway home, between uh, for people that were sort of too sick to be at home and yet uh, actually uh, too well to be in a hospital. And the competition that seems to have been in my folks. Uh, like my mom and my dad, and my dad worked for a dollar sixty-five for the CNR and the Bridge and Builders up north. Well, they taught you how to be a good husband and a well, sharing you husband. Well, the, uh, the changes have been different for the men. I, I heard a couple of men phone in this evening, and I've been sitting on the telly here waiting for a half hour. And basically, it came to my mind that men happen to have a different scenario than was way back when. Now, I happen to have inherited my father's rifle, for example, that was used to shoot elk and deer and elk, uh, you know. Uh, what do you use it for was now? Way available at the time. Well, my, my ma, uh, she had a couple of kids. My, my father. Well, uh, I'm sorry, Manitoba, sir. You you're know, just getting too far ahead for me. I've got to go to another call. Bye bye. We're going to be moving on now to Slocan. Slocan, you're on the air. Uh, good evening, Eleona. Uh, uh, I'd like to. Uh, hear what your fine panel has to say about uh, the disgusting situation up in Cranbrook where a newly elected MLA, a woman, Ann Edwards, was denied uh, leave of absence from her teaching position. I'll ask and Johanna to comment. Well, Ann Edwards, of course, is one of our new, new Democrat MLAs, and uh, she was not permitted initially by the board there at the college to take leave while she ran and was successfully elected. Now, of course, that has been turned around, which is the thing that should have happened. But I think it's interesting because it's typically one of those barriers that women have tended to face far more than men. Men, I think, um, often, whether they are in professions or in business or in other kinds of occupations, often their employers see it as, a, as an advantage to have someone from their environment be representing uh, the constituency in Victoria or in the House of Commons. Women traditionally have to 
first of all do that on their own time and then once they are elected or even if they're not elected there's no support for the employer they often have to leave their occupations they have to quit and have no job security to come back to and I think that is that was a just a very symbolic event of what what kinds of barriers women have faced but and she set up the beachhead she set up the beachhead and what was also interesting was that, that the attitudes of the public no longer accept that and that's I think right. that's wonderful we need more of that kind of support. Thank you for your call sir we're moving she on. She had support of a number of male politicians of the uh, governing party, incidentally, who also I'm were very, glad to hear that. Uh, very, uh, I mean, the, the candidate that she defeated but thought the, the decision was terrible. And right. The board initially the did make that decision, which was the mis original that, that's mistake. Excellent. Yeah. Now, one of the things we often make a mistake uh, in thinking once a beachhead is gained, that it stays right. gained. It does not stay gained. It has to be fought for in each generation. Yeah. You're on the air. Hello, Alana. Yes. This is uh, a question directed to you. My girlfriend is a mentor of yours, and she's expressed a yeah. definite desire for politics. You mean, you mean I'm a mentor to her? Darn right. Okay. <laughs> My question is, what does a woman find so attractive in politics? Well, I think that I, I will give my answer, but I also think all of the people here should too as well, because what we find in politics is the power to change things to make policies for a better world. And I'm just going to ask you for a quick move around the table on that. I think that's it, absolutely, that you see that this is the possible route to make some significant changes. And I've always believed that you have to have good people in government, good, decent, ethical people in government, if you're going to get good, decent, ethical decisions. Right. They don't all of a sudden find ethics when they reach the top. You have to have them feeding in throughout the whole system. And I think that women bring a certain attitude and um, uh, not that there aren't good and ethical men, but that's part of the equation. We've got to get good people in there. Kim? Well, I think you said it very well, and though I'm a politician and should elaborate on it by about another half an hour, I'll leave I you the <laughs> your words are Joanna. Superb. That's right. I think we all desire to participate in this very important forum. We're half of the society, and we want to have at least half the say, sir, and I appreciate your call, and tell your girlfriend that if she ever needs any help, to give me a phone call. Bye-bye. And I'll be back for a free-for-all, any subject you want, after the break. Well, welcome back. Free for all time at last. I, I know you were all wondering when I was going to get around to it. Well, here it is. You're on the air. Yeah, hi. I'm hi. Really uh, glad to see you hosting the program. I hope you get a chance to do it again. Well, I've enjoyed it. That's great. Uh, my question is, is, I'm curious if you yourself have noticed in being involved in what has been historically a male uh, arena, whether you've had to adopt any male mm -hmm. attitudes in order just to survive that kind of arena. You know, I never did try to, to win a, uh, approval of the male establishment, although I tried very hard to uh, bring women along, helping uh, to help them understand that uh, there must be more of us involved, and I've always tried to bring along younger women into the works. Um, yes, there is, uh, there is a male establishment. It's there, and lots of times you don't even speak the right language, and uh, I don't think I spoke the right language on many occasions. But it wasn't out of a, a desire to be miserable. It was just that I didn't know it. So yes, I had some curious times in that regard. But I learned a great deal. And I think that the first women, like Ellen Fairclough and Judy LaMarche, must have had a terrible time. Because people like Monique Bejan and me and uh, those in the middle, we seemed to benefit from what went before. And I hope that the new women who are in the cabinet now and the new women in the provincial houses will benefit from the work that's being done by women now. Thank you. Thank you. Going to another call, free for all, you're on the air. Uh, yes, I'd like to say season's greetings to you all first. And I'd like to ask a question of why is it when you're filling out an application for any job, it doesn't matter what it is, the first requirement is you write your name down, the second requirement is your sex. Why can you not fill out an application with your last name only and then all your qualifications and be judged on that, then brought in for an interview? So you know, therefore, they wouldn't know whether you're male or female, they judge you on your qualifications. Some jobs where there is no discrimination between male and female, I think it would be wrong to have the sex on it. But uh, I guess uh, even with the new human rights and the new Charter of Rights and Freedoms, there could be a contest on that point, couldn't there? 
There um, could be, yes, but yes. Uh, it would also eliminate an awful lot of uh, this business of, oh, well, that's a female. She wouldn't possibly be able to qualify for this job. Or just using your initials and not putting in your sex. Right. Your I know. initials and last name. I often get quite upset when I see some of the things you're supposed to put on uh, papers, too, uh, whether it's census or income tax or whatever. It doesn't seem to be any of their business to me. Exactly. Well, thank you for your call. Thank you. You're on the air. Go ahead. Oh, hello. I'd like to ask you uh, two questions. They're both related, and then I'll hang up and, and get your answer. Okay. The uh, first question was, um, what is your reaction to the, uh, the uh, recent showing of John Turner and his affirmation of the, from the party? And two, do you feel that, that the, um, the um, support that John Turner received from the party was also sort of a belated thank you to you for the amount of work that uh, you had done in making sure that there was a, a newer and revitalized party? Well, thank you. That's quite an opening, and I haven't been talking about my own politics while I've been on Jack's show. Yes, I was delighted to see John Turner get uh, the approval, and yes, I think there was a lot of satisfaction in the uh, second part of it because what we did was democratize the party. What I did is something like the guest I had on the other day, Diana Kilnori, for the Teamsters is trying to do, to let the ordinary member have more of a say in what happens. And so... Uh, my senator was Senator Lawson. Uh, her senator is Senator Lawson. My senator was Senator Keith Davey. <laughs> Thanks for your call. And we're going to go to another call now. You're on the air. Yes, good evening, Ms. Caminola. Hello. Yes, uh, my name is Peter, and I'm calling. I was actually trying to get through to your other guest, <laughs> but yes. unfortunately I got cut off. Uh, the discussion you had about priorities and logistics, there is a very unfortunate situation that evolves around the fact that all the support systems are geared towards single mothers. There are single fathers out there in the world. I am one of them. Well, I agree. And when they say single mothers, they should say single mothers and fathers because all the laws do say single fathers and single mothers or single parents. So you're quite right. Okay. Thank you. The problem that I have is that there are no support groups for single fathers. Perhaps you could start one, sir, in your own area, <coughs> probably through the school. The school uh, has tried to. Yes, and they're not enough, are there? That's right. Well, why don't you phone your number in here and we'll try to gather together a group for you. I'll be happy to do that. Do that off the air. Thank okay, you very much. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Now we're going to go to Victoria. Victoria, you're on the air. Yes, uh, the, uh, my, my question is on lack of women in politics. Yes. It's my opinion that uh, men haven't done that well. And I will note that in Canada, all parties have uh, democratic elections for nominees. Uh, Myona, uh, why not uh, just get enough women to uh, join any riding, vote that way, and you have a woman candidate. So get yes. active, but don't complain. I think, I think that's quite right, although uh, and oftentimes women indicate that they think that the campaign managers are perhaps anti-woman, but that's not true. In my view, a campaign manager will take anyone as a candidate as long as that person is a potential winner. And uh, so far, most uh, of these managers seem to think that women are, have less winnability quotient than men. So yes, it's true, you can take over a riding association and bus in your women candidates' uh, assistants and win a nomination that way, but are you going to win the election? No, uh, one can only hope so. And what's going to happen more and more, I think, is we're going to see women being put against women in the field. So there'll be women candidates against women candidates, so at least some women will win. Yeah. Thanks for your call. Okay. And my next call is, you're on the air. Hello. Go ahead. Hello. Um, I have a comment which uh, I guess is basically based on my frustrations as a woman in our uh, current political situation or, or, or um, state. And it is particularly with um, respect to the issue of abortions in the province. Um, some of the recent comments made by the Premier would indicate that... Um, he well, I'm sorry I have to wind up. Excuse me. I'll be back after the break. Join me tomorrow on Webster when we're going to be dealing with Yuletide stress and talking about volunteer grandparents. That will be at 5 p.m. precisely.